A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I am your host, Anna Garcia. We are recording this on September 22nd of 2021. Our guest today is former public defender and current criminal defense attorney, Danielle Iredale, who joins us from San Diego. Danielle, we're so glad you're back. You have been on maternity leave and we're grateful to have you back. Congratulations. How's the baby? Thank you so much. She is so cute. And my little son is loving her and calls her Bebe. So we're off to a good start. Oh, that's fabulous. We're going to keep to time today because you've got to get to court and we appreciate that you are here. Last night, as I was reviewing these cases and getting the script together, I have to tell you, I had to light a candle. Okay. That's how bad this is such a situation today. So these are the cases we're looking at. There is new information that is coming out of Colorado in the case of Suzanne Morphew. That is the mom who went missing a year ago on Mother's Day. Her husband was arrested for murder, though she remains missing. The husband has been released on bond this week, but that's not the headline. The headline is the arrest affidavit that has unbelievable details I read it last night. It reads like a novel. It's unbelievable. And it, I'm just going to give you a few things just to think about. Spy pens and killing chipmunks. Okay? Okay? That's what we're talking about here. But first, we have an arrest finally in the 2012 murder of a North Carolina college student. The case has had a lot of clues, a lot of leads, but for years, progress seemed to be stalled until last week, the announcement of an arrest in this case. So this is the case of Faith Hedgepeth, a 19-year-old college student attending the University of North Carolina. Danielle, when you have a case like this that takes more than nine years to make an arrest, and the person arrested, everyone is scratching their head saying, what? Who? Did they even know each other? It's So when you have a case like this where someone's identified by DNA so many years later, as a defense attorney, if, if this family, this person came to me, you look at three things. Number one, is there an innocent reason for the DNA to be there? And that could be either one of two things, right? If I go missing my husband's DNA in our house, isn't gonna point to him as a suspect, right? Because he's supposed to be there. Or there's something called transfer DNA. Is it possible that this person arrested touched something and then the DNA ends up in the house, right? But in this case, and I'm looking through, it, it seems that the type of DNA we're talking about is not capable of transfer. And the other thing you'd look for that innocent reason to be there doesn't seem to come out yet, right? We have no evidence that these people knew each other. So for, from the beginning, I think it's going to be a you know an, an uphill case. And I do have to say, and I've been thinking a lot about this, right? And being out on leave with your children, it can't help but change your perspective a little bit. And you know, listening to the, the videos of the parents, this must, it's such, I have to say this because come on this podcast to offer counterpoints and legal interest, but I'm a human, right? And thinking about their daughter who they must have been so proud of, right? And she's at school and she wants to be a doctor. And so I, I, I don't want that to be lost when I'm bringing up these these legal points. I I do want to say that it is a a total tragedy and that when I'm offering suggestions here, it's because I want people to see about how this case is going to unfold and maybe the strategies that we're going to see. Absolutely. And we have nothing but compassion for this beautiful family. And Crime Watch Daily uh, did a lot of reporting on this case when it was cold. I know investigators always say it's not cold, but you know what? When it's five, seven years down the road, and there's no arrest. If you're the parents, it's cold, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, so let's get into some of the details here and then see, you know, what's going on and how this case is going to proceed. So Faith was found beaten to death on the morning of September 7th, 2012. I mean, that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. She was in her off-campus apartment in Chapel Hill and her roommate found her at about 11 a.m. Faith was indigenous. She was a member of the Haliwa Saponi tribe in North Carolina. She was on scholarship and studying to be a pediatrician. So last week, nine years, nine days later, Later, finally, an arrest. This is who's been arrested, a Durham resident, Miguel Enrique Salguro Oliveres, 28 years old, arrested on Thursday of last week on September 16th. Salguro Oliveres was charged with first degree murder. He's being held without bond in the Durham County Jail in North Carolina. Police have, again, they have not said if these two knew each other and if they did, how did they know each other? So we don't know the relationship between accused killer and victim here. However, I think the DNA is the most important part here. Apparently his DNA matched DNA from the crime scene and the results, the match came in on Wednesday, on Thursday, he was arrested. That's how quickly they moved on this. Chapel Hill police said that Miguel Oliveres was never a person of interest in the original investigation in 2012. And because she had a roommate, because there were ex-boyfriends, because there were male friends. And when I talk about ex-boyfriends, I'm talking about people in her circle, not just her. So they, they collected and tested 229 DNA samples to rule out suspects. That's how wide a net that they cast. And he never made it anywhere in the beginning, which is very interesting. So Danielle, here's where we do need your expertise on this. So the North Carolina Attorney General said that the arrest came after the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation and the Chapel Hill Police submitted a DNA sample to the state crime lab that matched a DNA profile found at the crime scene. So apparently the suspect had never been in the system. It sounds to me like the DNA that they matched came from the criminal database. That's what I read from this, Anna, and I think that's why there was a delay. In some of the articles, they mention later events, he stopped for driving under the influence, I think eventually pleads guilty to a misdemeanor. Now, at that point, each state does it differently, subject to the floor set by the Supreme Court about when they can connect or collect rather these samples. So at a certain point, he's arrested and he's convicted of a misdemeanor and then they can do the DNA swab. So this happens to all of our clients, either once they're convicted or sometimes when they're arrested on a felony, and then that goes into the database and then they'll run it. And that's how these state databases are how a lot of these, like you said, previously cold crime cases are now coming to light. They're now having new suspects. So that seems to be what, what the turn is in the investigation. Mm -hmm. His arrest, his DNA gets put into the system and then it comes up as a match when they run it. So that, that seems to be how they crack this case. But again, they're being very tight-lipped on the details, which is completely different from the next case we're going to talk about, where they are telling you everything. So a as we said, you know, Faith's parents were just devastated by this brutal, brutal murder. And you know that it's it's so it's just so sad um and when an arrest is made like this it brings up so many emotions again for the family so faith's mother connie made this public statement to the news cameras after the arrest was announced here's a clip of it when i cried it was tears of joy tears of relief knowing that someone had been arrested in her case. And I believe it's gonna be hard uh, the next months and years maybe to, for this to be resolved, but I'm praying and, and asking God to please let it not be too long. Danielle, 
Faith's mother asking that this next phase of the investigation, meaning the criminal prosecution, not take nearly as long as the first phase, which took nine years to get an arrest. It's a very reasonable request, but this could take years. It absolutely can take years. It's a first degree murder charge here, a very serious charge, the most serious in our criminal justice system. Her wishes are completely reasonable. They make sense. This is where I would have to say, though, at this point he is in, he's held without bail. He's been apprehended, he's been charged. At this point, defense attorneys are gonna get this case and they need to do a good job to make sure that all the rules are followed and that they're providing the best defense to this person. This is the part where patience, while it's so difficult, and especially in this case, because we have this really long delay, right? Nine years and nine days is a difficult thing to come by, but the system operates this way. And I would argue it benefits all of us. If ever we were accused of something, there are rights that need to be upheld. And if at the end it's a righteous case and he's convicted or pleads guilty, we can know that things were done properly. If it's rushed through, there's going to be viable basis for appeals and it will last actually much longer. So let's look at some of the details of the case as we know it. The Chapel Hill police say that Faith's body was found hanging off the bed over a pool of blood with her black shirt pulled up over her head and then she had no clothes from the waist down. She died from blunt force trauma to the head and there was blood spatter on the closet and then a bloody tampon was on the bed next to her. Now on the center of the bed, and this is the part that has always puzzled police, there was a small white paper bag, like takeout food bag, that kind of a bag, and written on it with ink, it said, and again, we don't know if this is one thought or three thoughts, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. Okay, so that, that gives you an idea of the violence of the crime scene, the, the additional violence in this message and I mean, this is written on fast food takeout bags. Uh, what do you make of this? So the, the image of the crime scene is just, just horrible. It's so brutal. It's so heart wrenching. It almost gives you a physical reaction when, when you hear it. And then the bag and my question about the bag, right, the first thing that stands out is that it is written in English. And from what I know of the case, it seems like this young man immigrated just perhaps two years prior, maybe in 2010, did see that he was using a court interpreter in the proceedings even now, nine years later. However, I would also say you could if you're very smart and you know, all right, this is what you've been arrested for, that bag is written in English, you're going to use the, oh, I don't speak English. I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Absolutely. And I think that's an argument the prosecution will make if this does go to a trial. It, it is something that we're talking about it here. We're noting it's a very interesting clue. And I, I do believe, Anna, that that is why they might have initially suspected her roommate's boyfriend, that they had looked at him as a suspect and thought that he had something to do with this, but he was able to provide DNA, he allowed a search, and he was cleared. So I'm really wondering what this means. Is that place there as a red herring? When are we going to learn more about this bag? Exactly. It's something that's always troubled everyone. Now, DNA from semen was collected at the scene and Faith had blood under her fingernails. She had cuts and bruises on her arms and legs. So clearly a very violent physical struggle here. Now, there were lots of accusations at the time. Um, many people suspected, as you said, the roommate's ex-boyfriend, other friends. I mean, again, more than 200 samples of DNA. And, and to be clear, you know, no one else was ever named as a person of interest. There's never been a suspect named that he, this is the first arrest this, you know, and they go from 
straight to the arrest. So Crime Watch Daily covered this case in 2015. And as I said, the parents never gave up hope. In fact, the father still had an old school phone where he had the last voicemail that his daughter left him saying, I love you. So, you know, he plays that over and over again to keep her alive and and her voice alive. So it's very, very brutal case. So let's go to the night and the day of the murder. On the night of September 6th of 2012, about 7.30, Faith and her roommate go to the library. By midnight, they're back in their apartment. And then a little bit after one, they decide to go to the bar called Thrill, The Thrill. Um, The girls meet up with some guy friends, ex-boyfriends, the whole thing. It's a group of, you know, it's college. They're going out. 2.38 a.m., the two women, right, Faith and her roommate, leave the bar because the roommate says, I don't really feel well. So, but they go home and then the roommate who says she's not feeling well, then leaves the apartment at 4.27 a.m. to meet a guy. So as you can imagine, that that always was something that was very suspicious to authorities. It's like, wait a minute, do you feel well? Do you not? Okay. But again, all these things could all be absolutely true and not criminal or suspicious in any manner. These are just you know, the the facts is presented by the police. Then at 4.16, oh no, at 11 a.m., at 11 a.m. the next day, the roommate comes back to the apartment and that's where she discovers Faith's body. Horrendous crime scene, horrendous crime scene. And then that later that afternoon, another thing that always puzzled investigators was that Faith receives a, um, a phone text from someone saying, who is this? You know, but again, that could have been an innocent response to something else. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because so far that's not where this case is today. But I wanted everyone to to know that over the nine years that everyone's covered this case, these are the directions in which authorities were going. So um, here's the interesting thing. Let's talk about the suspect now, right? So according to WRAL-TV, Police never considered Miguel as a person of interest, even back in 2012. And his mother told the television station that he did not attend UNC Chapel Hill, that he didn't really have many friends at the university. And then this is what the mother said, quote, my son is not a murderer. I believe in my son. I believe it. He said he don't know the girl. Okay, that's from the suspect's mother. So, Anna, two two things on that quickly. The first part is at the beginning, before this new information came out, this case reminded me a little bit of the Amanda Knox case from Italy. Remember with her yes. roommate who comes up missing and they think, is the roommate involved? Is the roommate's boyfriend involved? And then eventually a third party right, gets arrested Mm -hmm. for it. So this is, there's an interesting parallel here between those cases. With respect to the mother, it's also something I I wanna bring up and explain to people why once, once, as a defense attorney, once you get the case, you're stuck with what's out there. The way the rules of evidence work, that people can be compelled to testify. So at this point, we have the mother saying, he didn't know her. He told me he don't know the girl. That's what's called a party admission. So now at trial, the the defense attorneys are are somewhat stuck unless they can explain it with this one theory, right? He doesn't know her. And this harkens back to what I was saying before about if there's an innocent reason for DNA to be in the apartment. The mother's now come out, she's recorded. She's saying, he told me, He don't know her. So at this point, the case looks very open and shut. So one of the things you you keep referring to, and I know where you're going with this, or at least I think you do, about how the DNA could have gotten there. So um, according to some of the local reporting, the suspect worked as a drywaller and as a house painter. So my guess is that's where you're going. Is it possible he could have been in the apartment to do some work? We have no idea. No one has put that out there. I'm just 
saying that that is a, a possibility based on your theory. Or, and if we're assuming that the DNA is semen, the only at this point, and, and I'm saying this from, from what I know, of course, right? We don't know what we don't know. But what if this was someone, what if the argument is that they actually had a relationship? Now, it's not plausible at this point. We have no evidence that they had any communication with each other. But what if they met at the bar and then someone later comes in? Because we do have those texts from Faith to, I believe, her roommate's ex-boyfriend saying mm -hmm. she needs to know this. She needs to know what you're saying. Where does that go? Now, I'm, I'm not saying, and I know people are going to get upset at me in the comments and giving ideas. I, I'm not saying any of that. What I want to do is provide a context and, and point out that sometimes things that people say that seem like it's helpful, the mother's comments, actually come back and really seal the deal. In other words, they can be used in a way that's then going to hurt the person they're trying to help. And I hear you on that. And I think also if you're on the other side, you need to get that out there and say, hey, they didn't know each other. We don't know where this DNA is coming from. This may not be true. I have no idea. The man has been charged. So I, I, ha no. I have no idea. But, you know, there's there's a lot of that going on as well. You're starting to it's the public debate that is separate from what's going on in the courtroom. So uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about his prior criminal background because as you said, so he, he got on the radar last month in August. He was charged in Wake County with um, driving while impaired, having an open container of alcohol, having a fictitious vehicle tag, and having no license or insurance. And according to the Raleigh News and Observer, he was driving while intoxicated and convicted in 2014 for that. So here's the other thing, he missed his September 3rd Earlier this month, he missed his court date for the D for the DWI charge. And then there was a warrant issued for his arrest on September 7th. Seems to be unrelated, but there's there's a lot going on there. He is, I mean, it, if he is involved in Faith's murder as charged, he's providing a lot of extra, um, shall we say, pay attention to me in the legal system, right? By not showing up for court and getting a, uh, an arrest warrant. Absolutely. It's interesting too, because it seems like in 2014, he did go through the criminal proceedings, but then now he's warranting. Yeah. So, you know, he came to the United States from Guatemala in uh, 2012, excuse me, in 2010, that would be two years before the murder. And uh, his residence is in Durham, but he apparently lived in Chapel Hill in 2012, and he would have been 19 at the time. What do you say there, defense attorney? It's a, it's a good fact for the prosecution, absolutely, right? Him, him being there. He's still in the state. Uh, this whole case is so disturbing and upsetting, and it's... I, I wait to see what, what else comes out, what we learn, and you make a good point. We only know one side, right? We know what we know from the media at this point, and a lot of times it's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is. I always tell my clients, look, I don't know what I don't know. It's a tautology, but it's really telling because we can only speak based on the facts that we're given. And, you know, she had a very public part-time job because she was, you know, paying her way through school, even though she had a scholarship. Mm -hmm. So she was working at the time of her death at the Red Robin restaurant in Durham, which is not far from Chapel Hill. So not saying that that's where they would have met, but that is certainly, it's not like she was only on campus is what I'm trying to say, that she had... Uh, a lot of exposure to the public in different areas of her life, and they could have intersected there. He's being held without bond. The next hearing is scheduled for October 7th. So we will keep an eye on this case.
And I think we'll learn a lot more, Anna, after October 7th. I see that it's a probable cause hearing. We have those in California as well. And that's where the government puts on basically probable cause. This is why he's charged. Your Honor, you should bind him over and we should keep these charges. So that's where we're going to learn a little bit more and maybe we'll find out the narrative of, of what their theory is here. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next case, I am so obsessed with what I read last night. It is like the best arrest affidavit I have ever read in my life. I was just saying to Owen Michael, we should make this a separate podcast where I simply read from the court record. I mean, it is just like written like a movie. I don't know who put this this record together, but I think they're an aspiring writer or something like that. Okay, this next case is out of Colorado, and we've been following it very closely here. Suzanne Morphy was 49, and she was reported missing on Mother's Day of last year, Sunday, May 10th, 2020. She was last seen going for a bike ride from the house. Well... We don't know that she was seen going for a bike ride. She, that was the story that the husband said. She probably went for a bike ride. Apparently the last person to see her alive was the husband at five in the morning, he said, when he left to go to work and she was in the bed sleeping. Okay. So um, her husband, Barry Morphew, um, apparently is the last person to have seen her alive. And they lived in Salida, Colorado, which is about two hours west of Colorado Springs. So when her daughters could not reach her on Mother's Day, because they were off on a camping trip and the husband said he had gone to work, the daughters got nervous, called a neighbor, said, can you check on mom? No mom, call the police. And they find her bicycle and her helmet you know, somewhere along a dirt path where they live in this kind of remote area. So the thought at the time was, because this made huge headlines, was, oh, was she abducted? Was she attacked by a wild animal? Or did she run away? The problem with the runaway is she left her cell phone, her wallet, the keys. Where are you going to go? You know? So a lot of drama in this case, a lot of drama in this case. And conveniently, Barry, Barry was away that day. Um, okay, so Barry was charged with first degree murder, murder of his wife in May of this year. Okay, so a year later, Barry gets charged with Suzanne's murder, even though we've never found Suzanne. We don't know where her body is. Okay, and he remained in custody until last week. And then last week, he was permitted to leave because he managed to, you know, pay his his bond. The judge ruled that the case will go forward because there is probable cause. He has been charged with first degree murder, tampering with a deceased human body, tampering with physical evidence, possession of a dangerous weapon, and attempt to influence a public servant. Barry has pleaded not guilty, and he has said all along that he had nothing to do with his wife's disappearance. He doesn't know what happened to her. He is not guilty. Trial date is going to be set for, you know, 2020 from now. Okay, so he gets released. That's the big news, you think? No, that is not the big news. The big news is that on Monday, a 131-page arrest affidavit was finally released. The judge said, publish it. Oh, my God. God, this thing reads like a crime novel. I could not put it down last night. I just, I wish I could read you everything in here. It's amazing, amazing. Okay, so he's now posted a $500,000 cash only bond. He's out. And the other thing is out, all the details of what he allegedly said, what police found, the photographs. It's amazing. You know, Danielle, usually there is usually good information in these court documents, but I've never read anyone like this one. This, it's very interesting, right? That this comes out, that it's published, that it's so long. The, the first thing I have to say, and I know we've talked about this before, is that corpus delecti rule, right? When we have a situation where we have competing concerns, both are very valid. There is a disappearance presumed to be a murder. The victim, the victim's family, 
they're entitled to justice, right? They want to know who did this, was there foul play? And if there was, they should be prosecuted. But the other side is also a terrifying side because what if she is still alive? And I don't necessarily just mean the victim in this case, anyone, right? And then we run the risk not only of a wrongful conviction, but a wrongful conviction when there wasn't a crime. But I thought this was interesting right out the gate the detective sets forth, he says, look, it's been 355 days, right? We want to arrest him tomorrow on the one year mark. And she hasn't used her social security card. No new accounts are open. She hasn't traveled. And cites, interestingly, even though this is a Colorado case, cites a California case, which I looked up and read. And it's from many, many, many years ago, and basically goes through all of the circumstantial evidence. And the court said, this is enough. You can presume that this person is dead and you can proceed to a prosecution. Now, this day and age, I think the public probably feels a lot more comfortable after a year, given the surveillance cameras that we have in the world, given the cell phones, given the way that we live our entire lives with a social media footprint, with a media footprint. So at this point, after a year, you know, the judge says there's enough and the arrest affidavit is providing all of the circumstantial evidence of funny business, right? Enough to that a judge has said this is enough to charge him. Right. And there there were many suspicious things from the very beginning, because, you know, when police asked Barry, hey, how's your marriage? He's like, oh, it's fine. It's great. We're happily in love. However, Friends and family of Suzanne are telling a completely different story to police at the same time, including at least one of their children, you know, saying uh, friends and family said, oh, she was going to leave him. She had already told him she was going to leave him and he was really mad. He was very controlling. So they're hearing one version of events from multiple sources. And let's not forget all the other stuff that they dug up from her cell phone and notes that she kept in, you know, in the cloud and everything else versus the only person who's saying everything's fantastic is Barry. Okay. So, and then it's just, it's the little things like this that the court record shows you. I mean, they may be tiny, but when you put them all together, it's little things like he said, oh, you know, we had the great last night together. Uh, we made steaks and then we had sex and it was fabulous. And I left at five in the morning. She would never leave me. She loves me. There's no way she would leave me. This is what he keeps telling the police. Oh, yeah. You know, and they're going through the garbage and they're like, I didn't see any steak. What did you eat again? Right. <laughs> and Barry's just digging himself in and they're like. So I find one plate in the dishwasher. Where's the other plate? You know, it's those little details where the police are like, this is just really not adding up at all. And then as as the court record goes, meaning as the time passes, they start uh, picking up all the surveillance video. He was at a, a hotel far away because he was uh, said he was working, but they managed to pick up, according to the court records, all sorts of surveillance and photos of him throwing bags of things out, uh, carrying boots that they never found again. This is after he left the house. So um, little things like, I mean, these are the details where you get the person's character. The investigator said to him, it was Mother's Day. Why, why did you leave? And he said, it was Mother's Day, not Husband's Day. Ooh, Barry, Barry, Barry. Oh, but that's not the worst of the things that Barry said. Then he said to the police, I, I'm, I'm telling you, this thing is a novel. Um, he said to the police, I gave her like three to $400 cash a week spending money. So she never had to go to the ATM. He tells the police because Barry's the ATM. Oh my God, give me a bucket, I wanna vomit. Who is this guy? And you are you haven't mentioned my one of my favorite parts and I call it the Noah's Ark defense. When he tries to explain things, they keep confronting him with things and he goes on, well, maybe she was hit by a squirrel or a chipmunk and I was driving and here's why there's something on my car and the elk and all of the animals. And you also bring up something interesting about the trash in the Warrant. I can't tell you how many times I'm going through warrants, seeing if there's probable cause, seeing if it was valid. And investigators always start with the trash. We throw out so much 
So many clues can come from that. And we have no, the Supreme Court has said, we have no privacy interest in our trash because we're putting it out to be taken out, right? Of course, the trash inside our home is different. So this is someone who thinks they can outsmart everyone, excuse after excuse after excuse. And as always, the more you talk, the more they can impeach those little details. And sometimes prosecutors can get a conviction and may or may not have happened to me in my tenure, where it's not so much the client talking about the crime itself, but it's the superfluous details, right? Mentioning this, mentioning that, and then they can find evidence that counteracts that. And that's, I, I think, what happened here. That's a lot of the circumstantial evidence in this case. I mean, honestly, Barry should have just shut up. But no, when you read this, Barry won't shut up. He will not stop talking. And he's burying himself. Look, he says that he's innocent. He's always told the authorities the same thing. He doesn't know what happened to his wife. But I will say that by reading this, that Barry's not making any sense. He is not making any sense. Now, KUSA TV sums up the DA's case this way, which I, I think kind of says it all based on this is where the prosecution's going. That when Barry could not control Suzanne from leaving him, he shot her with a tranquilizer dart on the afternoon of May 9th of 2020 and then prevented her from leaving the house until the chemicals took effect he then killed her and disposed of the body. So that is the theory that prosecutors are working with because apparently they found evidence of some tranquilizer. Uh, like I would say to you, like, who shoots someone with a tranquilizer dart gun? Uh, unless you're Barry, who admits in these court records, Barry admits to uh, shooting deer, tranquilizing them, and then transporting them elsewhere for people to hunt them down for their antlers. Then he admits to police, he admits to police that he has shot more than 50 chipmunks on his property. He says, why? Because he can't sit still. Barry can't sit still. So he has to kill chipmunks. Who kills a chipmunk? A, a real creep of deep situation here. He's, he's definitely digging, digging himself deeper with all of these admissions. And when you talk about the way that they've summed up the prosecution case, it, it is horrifying. And I, I think I read somewhere too, they said they tranquilized her uh, like an animal. So obviously there's going to try to draw this parallelism between the hunting and the killing of a human being uh, in, in such a heinous way. That's, that's the accusation here. And I, I do have to say, we don't know. We don't know everything. This is a, obviously a one-sided affidavit. They're not required to put in any facts that lead to innocence, right? Any facts tending to suggest innocence. We're looking at one side, and this has been released without someone coming back and saying, well, let me, let me give you some more context. But at this point, it's a lot. It's well, a lot. At the very least, Barry is an admitted chipmunk killer, okay? Got no problems with killing animals, not suggesting, but he has been charged with murdering his wife. Let's get into some of the details because what was going on in this marriage, I think, again, paints a picture of what was going on between Barry, Suzanne, Suzanne's affairs. Apparently, Barry had a bunch of them, his search history, looking for young girls. I mean, there's there's just so much in this affidavit. I Honestly, we'd need another hour to get through this case. So let's be clear about a few things. Suzanne had made it clear to her friends and family that she was going to leave Barry. She'd been trying to leave Barry for a long time, but he was very controlling with the money. Apparently they had inherited money from their parents and, and she felt like she wanted some of that money back. And so money was an issue. It was one of the controlling factors that Barry had over her, according to family and friends. And let's not forget, Barry has called himself the ATM. So he's you know, squarely put himself in, in the position of controlling the money. So she was going to leave and they believed that, that this is this was the final confrontation that he was not going to let her leave. And that's why he allegedly killed her. OK, so remember, he said he left at 5 a.m., but he could not describe to investigators. Well, what did she look like in the bed? All he said was, oh, you know, like a lump under 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 the comforter. And he had to be kind of given that imagery. 
by investigators, which makes you believe, oh, maybe he has a different vision of his last memories of, of Suzanne. So um, apparently he did try to destroy evidence that proved that Barry knew that Suzanne was leaving him, okay? That he started deleting things. Um, this is one of my favorites is, so he deletes everything, but then for whatever reason, he held on to a message of hers that he held and I guess he held it as like a photo or a snapshot, which is basically her telling him, I'm leaving you. I don't care anymore. I, I'm just paraphrasing, paraphrasing there. So Barry does not do, Barry's not good at covering his tracks is what I'm trying to say. And the truth is nothing's deleted today, Anna. Right. They can get almost anything. Maybe it's not from the physical, but cell bright downloads of phones. Nothing is really no. deleted. No. So as the investigation is going on, right, there are searches for Suzanne, her family is is trying to mobilize search teams while all of this is going on in real time. Police are going through phone records, computers, all of that stuff. And so they find out that Suzanne had an affair in 2018 with a friend from high school and they remained in contact. And she apparently was one of the last people, she apparently sent him a photo of herself, kind of like a proof of life photo. So it, she had shared even with him that Barry was suspicious. So on May 8th of 2020, Suzanne writes in her notes, you know, the little app on your iPhone that yeah. Barry has accused her of cheating. Okay. well. You know, she is um, not a reason to kill anybody, not a reason to kill anybody here. Um, and that last proof of life selfie was at 2 p.m. on Saturday. So that's the last time anybody knows that Suzanne was for sure alive would have been the Saturday right before Mother's Day. So she texted that selfie to her boyfriend who lives in Michigan. And then she never replied to the message 45 minutes later. Now, here's this is like the extra drama in the middle of all this. So the man she was having an affair with is married with six children. And so when she disappeared, he kept mum about anything he knew about her because he says in the affidavit, in the court records, that he didn't want to get into trouble because it would cost him his wife, his family, and his job. Hello, buddy. Maybe you should have thought of that first before you had the affair. Hello. What is wrong with people? Consequences for your actions. Own them. So two things for that. The There's something we call the SODI defense, which is some other dude did it. <laughs> and so I'm thinking if I'm Barry's attorney, you're going SODI defense, right? This guy knows that he's in a relationship with this person. She all of a sudden isn't answering him. Why doesn't he say anything, right? His lawyer, if he's charged, then comes back and says, well, he was married and he had the kids. Now, the other thing that's, I think, so chilling about this case is that she's keeping what appear to be contemporaneous notes almost to suggest that she thinks she's going to have to speak from the grave later. Right. When I get in a fight with my husband, I don't take a note, a notepad. Owen said this. I said this. We don't do that. Right. So it's actually very, very sad to me thinking about this woman who, who, you know, whatever happened to her at this point, the judge has said there's probable cause to believe that she's dead, but that she was living in, in this relationship in fear such that she had to take these surreptitious notes and document what her husband's accusing her of. And also they, they uh, allude to some previous abuse, alleged abuse between the couple. Yeah, I, I mean, the, some of the things that, that Barry told investigators, it, it just is, you know, again, his whole like, I didn't, I can explain the tranquilizer stuff. I didn't want to because I know now I'm going to get into trouble for shooting a wildlife. It's like, yeah, but that's like the least of your worries, Barry, considering the charges, you know, that, that you're facing here. So um, this was another very interesting nugget in the court record. So in January of 2021, they go ahead and they, they question Barry again. So Barry gave constantly, the, every time they find something, they go back to Barry and say, you know, Barry, you said this. However, we found that. It's, it's the, this is the way the court, written, uh, court record is written. It's a constant back and forth. It's like, 
okay, Barry, what are you going to say this time? So one of the things that they discovered was that she had one of those spy pens. It's um, a pen that can record audio and or video. Um, you know, they, they someone actually gave me one as a gift once. Half the time I can never get the thing to work. I'm not using a spy pen. Just saying, but, but they found it and they were able to not only retrieve the files that were on there, but the deleted files that were on the spy pen. So she apparently, according to court records, put the pen in his truck one day while he was driving. She wanted to know what he was up to and he, what he was saying. Okay, the entire road trip, the man is listening to forensic files, okay? And Barry is listening to a specific case about a person who disappeared and their bike was found. <laughs> Okay, probably just coincidence. <laughs> I will say if if watching forensic files makes you guilty, lock me up, Anna, because right. I'm okay. a huge, huge fan. But the bike, it, it's all of these little things that add up. But the best part was, can you imagine, I wish that I had been in the room when the authorities said to Barry, oh, did you know Suzanne had a spy pen and used it on you? Oh. <gasps> Oh my God, Barry, the ATM would have been spitting out cash, choking on it, so upset. Um, <laughs> oh my Lord, my Lord. Okay, so um, the other things that were very suspicious, because you know, we can't get into everything, is shortly after her disappearance, he starts making all these moves in court in Indiana, which is where they, were, where they had moved from, to basically wrestle control of all of their finances because they had some joint accounts and joint property. Then, then, and we reported this on the podcast that was very interesting, Barry then sells the three-bedroom house from which she disappeared for $1.6 million. This was 10 months after Suzanne went missing. Now, I know from a lot of the cases I've covered, when someone disappears, Family members generally, especially if it's a parent or a spouse, will never leave the property from which they left because they are so fearful that if they move, this would be the last place that they, that they would come to. Like if, God forbid, they've been chained in a dungeon and they emerge, the only thing they know is the house address, right? Or the phone number. So people never change their phone numbers and they never move because they sit there and they wait for the loved one to reappear. Not Barry. Barry sells it, and this is what he said at the time, which we discussed in the podcast and is quite reasonable. He said, you know what? This house has terrible memories for my children, and so I want to get rid of it. Okay, everybody handles things differently. So then he also sold other properties. He had some vacant lots that he sold, um, and everything was, was happening all at once. So, you know, I, I've given you kind of like the headlines of, of what's in here, but I mean, everything down to surveillance of him dumping trash bags in different locations on Mother's Day and before he was contacted by authorities. I mean, there's just... And, and the stories that keep changing. And then he says weird things. Like in, in part of the affidavit, he says something about how, um, you know, uh, okay, Barry claims that his wife would never leave him and that, of course, she would never have an affair, even though he suspected of an affair. That's He was, you know, stalking her because, of course, it doesn't look good on him. So then he makes this comment to authorities. Well, maybe in God's eyes, this was his way of resolving something as if Suzanne got something she deserved. Incredibly eerie. And I think, and he also sells another property at a loss. And this is after, and I mentioned this because he's out right now on $500,000 cash. Mm -hmm. So he had those assets, he was able to free them up. Uh, this is also a, another podcast and another time, but it's a comment, I think, on our bail system and who can buy their way out and who's sitting, you know, waiting on much, much less serious charges. I'm sure you know my thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. But you, you point out a, a good point. It's, it's all of this moving of the money and moving the financials. Uh, there's certainly an argument that if your wife's missing, you're distraught. And the last thing you're thinking about is organizing your finances. Now, his counterpoint, I think, is a valid one also with bad memories for my kids. And maybe, you know, I need to get everything in order for my kids. Right. It's a different 
thing. It's not just him, a single guy who could just sit there. We'll mm-hmm. see, see what else comes out in this case. I think the part that I can't figure out is why is Barry still holding on to, we had a great marriage. We had a great dinner that, that night. We had sex. Everything's fabulous. Like Barry won't let go of that narrative, no matter what authorities show him, even though, according to Suzanne, he suspected that she was having an affair. That's part of why she was stalking him and because she was threatening to leave. So I find that interesting. It's like, why hold on to that narrative? Why not just say, yeah? I mean, it, they've got the, the, the proof, all these people saying it, plus Suzanne in her own words saying it to him, I'm leaving you. The, the hardest part to overcome is Suzanne's own words, right? Saying, I'm leaving you. I can imagine making the argument that maybe once someone's gone, you want to look back and idealize things, but it seems like a pretty important fact, right? Someone might be leaving out. You could say, look, I loved her. We had years together, children together. Things maybe were a little rocky, but I still consider her the love of my life. That's very different than this person is absolutely not going to leave me, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the bicycle was interesting because he's the one who said to authorities that, oh, my wife has just taken up mountain biking. Why don't you go see? Maybe she went on the trail. It's like he led authorities to that. And then they're looking at the bike and the helmet and it's got no blood on it. It didn't look like it crashed. They looked for, um, it was pretty heavily uh, thick brush in the area. So they were looking for any indentations where a body may have landed like if she had hit something. But there was no evidence of any of, of any of that. Or if someone right dragged her away. Nothing. An animal, a person. It doesn't seem like they, they've mentioned discovering any of that. Yeah. And as you said, you mentioned earlier about how he always had an answer for something. And I just want to clarify this so people understand when you talked about the hitting an elk, like his GPS showed um, he's telling one version of events and the evidence, according to authorities, is pointing to other things. But he always has an answer for it. Like, why is there a dent here? Oh, I hit an elk. Why are you going in this direction? I was trying to get away from this. I mean, the man always has an answer for everything. Barry has an answer for everything. Well, I think it's fascinating. I do think that the decision to release this level of detail, I think is really like putting a vice grip to Barry and Barry's defense. That's right. You're not wrong. That I've never had, I haven't had crazy public cases. I've never had the arrest warrant, arrest affidavit publicly released. Uh, Certainly, there seems to be a question of fairness, right? They're releasing all of this. And then how are they going to pick a fair jury if Barry wants to go to trial? That's a concern that we have to consider in this decision. I don't know what, what went into it, right? A judge ordered it released. I don't know who asked for it, if the prosecution requested it. But when there is all of this publicity and not just publicity, right? Sometimes it's just speculation or little facts we're putting together. Like you said, this is a novel. It's like a true crime novel, 130 pages. Insane. And I want to correct here. I thought it was 50 chipmunks. Apparently he killed 85 chipmunks. I'm telling you that the little animals in the forest are going to take their revenge on Barry the ATM here. Okay. Got no sympathy for Barry. Sorry. No sympathy. Okay, it is time for our comment section with our producer, Owen Michael, who monitors all our social media. And Owen, what are the crime cases everybody else is talking about? Hi, Anna. Hi, Danielle. Yes, we do get comments. We read all of them. Um, I've got some entertainment-related news uh, this week. Grease actor. You guys remember the movie uh, Grease? Yes. I got chills. No, I'm sorry. (laughs) That's one of uh, that's one of those movies. Um, everybody has one. I have never seen Grease to this day. I'm uh, the only really? person I know that hasn't seen it. So, but I'm familiar with this actor. Here's uh, here's what we got. We got Grease actor Edward Deason was yelling loudly and disturbing other customers inside last week uh, and had to be forcefully removed from a bench seat table area at a restaurant in Maryland. The actor threw numerous items at deputies, which included plates, bowls, and food, according to the Allegheny County Sheriff's Department. At least one deputy was struck by the debris. 
Deason was arrested for assault, and disorderly conduct, and trespassing. It's unclear what prompted what prompted this fracas. Uh, Deason, of course, is Eugene Felsnick. He's, uh, I guess, the class nerd in the 1978 movie starring John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. He's been in a bunch of other stuff. We uh, will have more when we know it. Uh, Patsy S. says, he's really let f- his fame go to his head. <laughs> Olivia S. says, uh, he knew he was wild after he threw that pie at Ca- Coach Calhoun like that. These are all in-movie references that I'm not uh, entirely clear on. James S., <laughs> in his defense, he'll forever be known as Eugene Felsnick. I'd be mad, too. That's and right. Des- Spaghetti in your eye for that one, right? <laughs> Desiree G says, who was he in Greece? I don't remember him. Wah, wah, wah. Sorry. Me, too. Um, I, can't, I can't remember him. But he, it was a long uh, time ago. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll throw up a, a photo of the, okay. the particular guy, but uh, you probably would recognize him. He's having a bad time of it, you know? It's hard. Could be a, could be a, a play for publicity. You're looking for some uh, fresh roles, get out there in the public eye, who knows? Oh my God, maybe he'll get a reality show out of this. (laughs) Oh, Owen, (laughs) thank you. We needed that after all the sadness of Barry the ATM and killing all the chipmunks. Indeed. All right, we'll see you next week. See you guys next week. Bye. Oh, Danielle, Danielle, what cases we went through this week. I'm so glad you're back. I'm so glad you're back and working. I know you have to rush off to court, but where can people find you if they want to follow you on social media or they need an attorney in San Diego? Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be back. It feels good to do things like this, to get back to court, even though it's hard, you know, leaving your little guys at home. Uh, So I have an Instagram. I got to get it a little more pumped up, but I do love... Uh, to see listeners follow me and, and make comments. Uh, my Instagram is Iredale Law, I-R-E-D-A-L-E-L-A-W. I've got a website and my name's Danielle Iredale. Now that we're, we're friends, I've done this podcast a few times. I do go by Danny. Usually I was holding that back. Um, and I think I'm ready to come in, come into that and let you all know that friends, family, call me Danny. So it's, it's been really nice. Thank you for having me back. And um, for letting me talk about these cases, which were really sad, really intense, but I'm glad that we're going to talk about them. I feel like our relationship has really grown now, Danny. <laughs> it's, like, it's like really big moves. Um, it is. Listen, you're trusting me. I, I yeah. feel you're trusting me now. You're, you're in the circle. <laughs> and you can find me on all social media at Anna G News, Anna with one N. That is our show for this week. You can, of course, find all our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, True Crime Daily, to get updates. Also, we have a newsletter that Owen puts together. You can subscribe at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. Don't do crime.